Sony is a rather paradoxical company. The same umbrella that has brands like PlayStation and the Alpha cameras, which permeate most of our daily lives, also has a smartphone division that many of us barely hear about. And you know what? No amount of product placement in like the James Bond movies or Cobra Kai seems to really change that. But this year marked a new path for the Xperia line. The Xperia 1 Mark II made a splash by having more influence than ever before from the Alpha division, bringing a camera experience that is unique and honestly, a little intimidating when compared to many other smartphones. Roughly the same camera and feature philosophies return in this new update that is a little bit smaller but packs quite the punch. And I think that Sony has hit a wonderful sweet spot. This is Pocket Now, and I'm Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? These are my thoughts on the Sony Xperia 5 Mark II. Quick blast from the past. Do you remember the Xperia Compact phones? They were literally just smaller versions of the main devices in Sony's camp, but with all of the same specs, cameras, and overall features. Sure, the screens and batteries shrunk, but the compact phones were still like little beasts. We haven't had one of those in a while, but the Xperia 1 Mark II and this Xperia 5 Mark II still strike that spirit. And then you dig a bit deeper and some real surprises appear. I mean, the bodies are practically the same, but that's true for pretty much any Sony Xperia phone from like the last half decade. The design language never really changes, it just gets a few tweaks here and there. And each tweak shows you what Sony is prioritizing in each new phone. First off, the smaller size is probably my favorite part. I'm all for having a phone that has high quality of life, but doesn't skimp on the power. And in that regard, the Xperia 5 Mark II literally has that spirit of the compact in mind. Around the body of the phone, you have the usual Xperia tropes. Headphone jack up top that also includes plenty of tweaks for your listening experience uh, once your headphones are plugged in. By the way, let's just take a second and realize that this smartphone's not too large and it can still accommodate a headphone jack. Take some notes, everyone else. And on the topic of sound, there are stereo speakers that are in the slits above and below the display. There's also an interesting sound setting called dynamic vibration, which uses the haptics engine to basically bring varying degrees of rumble to the audio. I don't think there's anything wrong to it, but I just don't think it's really adding a whole lot to the overall experience. Now, all of the buttons are here on the right side. You have the volume rocker, the power button with the embedded fingerprint reader, and a Google Assistant key and the dedicated camera button. Now, like with all Xperia phones, the camera button is always appreciated. And this Google Assistant key is an interesting addition, the kind that you hold and talk to Google with walkie-talkie style. Say what you will about how much you might actually use it, it's still impressive that they can add yet another button on top of everything else. So what about the internals? Well, they are where you would expect a high-end 2020 smartphone to be. The Snapdragon 865 brings the power, the 4000 mAh battery keeps it running with 21 watt fast charging, and expandable 128 or 256 gigabytes of storage is there for your creative, gaming, or media consumption endeavors. So you get everything that made the Xperia 1 Mark II a competitor in the 2020 market, but jam-packed into a phone that is still IP certified and honestly just has a much higher ease of use. Which is why it's a surprise that the display got some extra love. Sony puts a lot of features in their screens no matter what panel they're using, but in the Xperia 1 Mark II, there was an OLED panel that already looked great even before you turned on various settings and enhancements. Sure, this time around the display shrinks down from 6.4 inches to 6.1, but Sony decided to go in on their slightly more affordable follow-up with a 120Hz refresh rate. It's a simple toggle in the display settings. You can get all 120 or not all 120. I'm honestly still so impressed at how good this display looks on top of how easy it is to work with. Colors are vibrant and the OLED panel lends itself to proper always-on display capabilities and it's a joy to use for all kinds of visual endeavors. Not to mention with that refresh rate, it's incredibly smooth. Gaming and media in particular benefit from all of these settings including video image enhancement. And any PlayStation fans out there can look to the Xperia as a great way to use PS4 Remote Play. As a matter of fact, the Xperia 1 Mark II was one of my main ways of playing Persona 5 Royal. But I've left one other unique aspect to this display off until now. I said aspect, which was an unintended pun, but I do mean the 21 by 9 aspect ratio. This is not something that is new to Sony phones, but it might be a little new to some of you who are new to Xperia's. In a lot of ways, the tighter ratio provides a lot of benefits. In one-handed use for the Xperia 5, swipe typing has never been better. Vertical video and even video calls are totally unique experiences that are always visually pleasing. And Sony made sure to take advantage of the tall real estate by making multi-window a priority. 
Multi-window can be triggered using a home screen shortcut or the side sense bar, which is this little bar that responds to different swipe directions. Swipe up and you get a guide showing you how to make a two-app canvas. As long as you're not trying to type something while on the multi-window, both apps tend to look right at home. Now, not all apps work with multi-window here, but that's true for other Android phones as well. Okay, so we've covered all of the ways that this phone hits all of the right marks as far as being a general daily smartphone. But what about the Xperia as a smartphone camera? You see, until 2020, there was still this weird yet again paradoxical part of every Sony smartphone. Sony makes all of the sensors in every smartphone that we generally review, but they can never quite get the hang of those sensors in their own devices. That seemed to finally change when the Alpha team got involved, and they brought not only their software but also some philosophies to the hardware. You see, this camera array that sacrifices the time of flight sensor from the Xperia 1 Mark II has three 12 megapixel sensors. The main sensor is a typical wide 24mm at f1.7 aperture, while the ultra wide 16mm and the telephoto 70mm go down by a few stops. Now, did you notice what I said in those last couple of sentences? A lot of that was some like deep camera talk, the kind that you would say when holding like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. And if you're coming from that world, what this phone offers is going to be a treat for all of your control freak sensibilities, thanks to two apps, Photo Pro and Cinema Pro. None of this is to say that the main camera app is bad, it's just clearly not as big a priority. You can use it to get some quick photos or videos without much fuss, but also without that much control. A couple of modes like slow motion and panorama are available, but that's about it. There's also no dedicated night mode. For low light shots, you just have to stick to the main sensor and let the low light mode do its best. The main app is also the place to get selfies, and honestly, the 8 megapixel front shooter is just not all that great. Pictures from there look washed out, and the video suffers as well. There are some selfie portrait and beauty modes though, if you do need them included in your selfie shooter. It's clearly all about these three main sensors, which honestly we can look at as full-on lenses. In the same way that I would take a lens off of this mirrorless camera I'm using right now to achieve a different focal length and a different look. This is very clear in the Photo Pro app. Go to 16 and then you can optically zoom up to 24. From there, you can switch to the 24 millimeter lens and then unlock the zoom levels that go up to 70. From there, you can swap over to the 70. Any avid Sony shooters know this is basically the smartphone equivalent to the holy trinity of zooms. But let's take a step back and look at the Photo Pro app. It's got all the manual controls you would expect on top of a typical camera. Now, anyone out there that prefers dials for most of these settings will have to contend with the touch interface, but that's if you want to go full manual. Even HDR or DRO are deeper in the menu system. But you know what, you do get control over shutter speed, ISO, white balance, raw shooting, and shooting tools are available like a proper leveler. The thing is the Photo Pro mode also comes with a full-on auto or program mode where you can dial in certain settings if you need to. So as far as photos are concerned, you can still get some of the typical smartphone camera conveniences in the Photo Pro app, of course minus the front-facing shooter. This shift in control philosophy doesn't really change the quality of the photos you get from these sensors, which are all good performers. There won't be any super high-res shooting modes from like 48 or 108 megapixel sensors, but you know what? All of the results in both photo and video are sharp and solid in quality. Only low-light shooting really suffers because Sony is not Google or Apple with the night modes and whatnot. But you can always just set the shutter to something long, put the phone on a tripod, and let it do its thing. Before crazy HDR and algorithmic processing, this was how night photography worked. Now things get more complicated once you factor in video. Cinema Pro is even more of a control freak's dream, especially one that is a fan of Sony cams for filmmaking. First off, you have to think about what you want to do before you go in. You're asked to make a project that will lock the resolution and the FPS because it's keeping everything in check, including that intensive shot list you might have in your brain. If you want to set these to anything else, you have to make a new project and then shift your brain a little. The zoom levels are also gone. 16, 24, and 70, all of these become prime lenses. There's no auto or program mode. You have to dial in every setting that is available. Sure, there's an auto button for shutter and ISO in case you do need a little bit of help, but the point here is that this kind of workflow is for the person that has probably planned out the shoot beforehand, and they're just using the all-in-one tool that is the Xperia 5 Mark II. 
Is everyone going to enjoy this kind of learning curve or shooting experience? Honestly, that really depends. What I will say is that there are a couple of compelling reasons to use Cinema Pro on this phone. First off, the looks. There are multiple looks that are simulated from Sony's cameras, and if you're looking for that style, well, it's there. I shot pretty much all of my footage using the Venice CS profile, which is a pretty classic look, especially for Sony. But if you want no stylized look, there is an option for uh, NA, and it's all the way at the bottom. But the other reason to use Cinema Pro is because of the built-in focus racking. Manual focus is one thing, but then you can set A to B points and then hit them for half second to three second focus transitions. Focus racking is literally one of my favorite things to do across all of my videos, and it's great to see it available in a smartphone, the Xperia 5 Mark II. So you would use Cinema Pro when you know you want to get some specific production going. All of the tools are there, from the hardware to the somewhat daunting manual controls and the software. The Xperia 5 Mark II ultimately is one of the most complete phone packages I've used in a while, but that's coming from someone that does live in the complexities of cameras, photography, and videography. This is the level of detail that many of us always wanted from our smartphone cameras, and now that it's here, I can't help but love it, but also feel very conflicted by it. You see, the paradox continues. Sony created a great smartphone in the Xperia 5 Mark II that literally hits all the right marks of a good daily reliable smartphone. You have a Google Assistant key, 120Hz refresh rate, a compact size, and great performance. But in focusing more on the hardcore content creator, they might have sacrificed some of the conveniences that smartphone cameras have these days. A night mode, for example, a good selfie shooter, and feature-heavy auto modes that are catered to the general user. The Xperia 5 Mark II is simultaneously Sony's best smartphone for prosumer creatives, and then the worst camera for casual Sony entertainment fans. Now, I do think Sony is carving out their own path, and it's going to get a lot of support. In so many ways, this phone is actually quite the home run. But with the camera as such a priority, I can't help but wonder if enthusiasts who might already have an alpha camera on their side or a ZV-1 in their pocket are already plenty satisfied with their creative tools and can't justify paying $999 for the Xperia 5 Mark II. If anything, they might just want their smartphone to be simple because everything else is already so complicated anyway. And then there are the casual users who are keen on the rest of this phone, but they will have a steep learning curve to really get the best out of what Sony focused on this time around. Ultimately, Sony continues to be a paradox, one that I, clearly at least, am more than happy to continue trying to understand. And so there you have it, my thoughts on the Sony Xperia 5 Mark II, one of the most interesting phones of the year because Sony went all in on very specific aspects of the experience. Of course, we're talking about the camera, but all of the other parts of the phone are no slouch. There's so much to love about this phone. The Xperia 5 Mark II is set to come out next month, and like I said before, it is just shy of 1,000 US dollars. Let me know if you're going to pick one up, or if you have the Xperia 1 Mark II, and what your experience has been, let us know in the comment sections down below. At the very least, drop some likes on this video and subscribe to Pocket Now if you haven't already, because videos are coming out pretty much every single day. From there, though, we're going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other, and we will see you in our next video.